Thank you, everyone, for joining uh, today's uh, Bhakti Sangha session. And uh, today we have a special uh, session for uh, Krishna Janmashtami, and we have a very special speaker, His Grace uh, Chaitanya Charan Prabhuji. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, you're there on the call. Hare Krishna, Dandavat. Hare Krishna Prabhuji, Dandavat Pranam, Srila Prabhupada, Vijay Guru Maharaj, Vijay. Thank you so much, Prabhuji, for uh, giving your association on this auspicious day. Uh, very fortunate to have your uh, time on this Bhakti Sangha session, Prabhuji. You can please take over the call. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Are you able to see my screen? No, Prabhuji, we can see you, your photo. We are not able to see you. Oh, just a minute. That's strange. Mm -hmm. My audio is clear. Yes, Prabhuji, it's perfect. Okay. Sorry. Actually, I started my video, then I started sharing my screen, and the video has disappeared. Just give me a minute. Yes, Prabhuji. It shows your video is disabled. Oh, okay. So you can once again uh, uh, start video. Click on the start. Yes, Prabhuji. Ah, Wonderful to be here on the occasion of Janmashtami. Wish you all a very happy Janmashtami. Hare Krishna. So, I will speak today. Uh, using this PowerPoint, I will speak today on the occasion of Janmashtami about the topic might seem a little intimidating, but it brings out beauty of the Krishna conception of God. Om Ajnana Timirandhatsya Jnana Anjana Shalakaya Chakshuron Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishthaya Bhutale Shrimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Itinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Virvishesha Shunyavadi Pascha Pideshitarine Pancha Kalpataru Pescha Kripa Sindhu Bhavacha Patitanam Pavanibhyo Vaishna Vibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhupyananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhatta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna. So today, we'll try to understand broadly what is the conventional or contemporary conception of God and how the conception of Krishna, especially Krishna in Vrindavan, is radically different from that. And how, what that tells us about the nature of Krishna and how we we'll conclude by how that is manifest that can be manifest for all of us on the occasion of Janmashtami. So in today's world, pe people perceive God primarily in two ways, as a judge or as a crutch. Now what do I mean as a judge? That we see that society often things go wrong and things don't just go wrong, people do wrong. So sociologically today's today many people think that the idea of god is something which people in the past came up with because they wanted to cultivate fear from among people for doing wrong things for doing wrong things so for example there was a prominent atheist voltaire you know he would get his friends together and he would talk about atheism with them but when he would talk about atheism, he would ensure all the doors and windows of, the, all, of that room would be completely closed. Because he didn't want any of his servants to hear that there is no God. 
because he thought if they think there is no god they will they, they, they will start stealing silver and other things from my house so his idea was that god doesn't exist but god is a construct to keep people from doing wrong things and also that if some people do wrong things yes they may not get punishment immediately but they will get punishment eventually we all need a sense of hope and justice in the world and sometimes hope and justice is not immediately visible so that is a that the deferred justice was one idea so now this is primarily today's skeptical mind views god there can be various other reasons but skeptically people say oh Oh, this is God is simply just meant to create fear. So now this also has caricature. This also some caricatures in India. There was a movie P K, which talked about how people go to God because of fear. So I responded that actually I had written a book in response to that. Actually, we do so many things out of fear. But the other option is other thing is that God is a crutch. now this is this is a subtle way in which atheists try to minimize or denigrate people who believe in god they say that those people who are not strong enough to face life's challenges they are emotionally weak you know they need god as a crutch that they can't they they need they need a belief in some protective figure who will take care of them so god they treat is like a emotional crutch and in this way they say that these are all primitive reasons for believing in god we humans should grow up and stop believing in such things however now we will not go into the merits or demerits of this particular belief uh we or this particular conception of god it could be very easily refuted in many ways because quite often it's not just people who are emotionally weak who believe in god some of the most intelligent people throughout history even in the world of science people some of the most important scientists uh, believed in god and even today there are a large number of scientists who do believe in god in some ways but beyond that let's move on so this is the world in which many people conceive of god and in such a world when we bring in the krishna conception Now, if we see Krishna in Vrindavan, is neither a judge nor a crutch. We are not talking about Krishna in Mathura, not the Krishna who comes to say yada yada hi dharmasya. That's there. But let's focus right now for Krishna as he is conceived in Vrindavan, as he is described in Vrindavan rather. So there, what Krishna is doing? Krishna is neither a judge nor is a crutch. He is a ras raj. He is simply the reciprocal relisher of rasa. rasa which comes through the reciprocation of love just to look at this point that that normally if somebody is a judge then there is a fear fear of law fear of the judge's punishment but if we look at the rajuvasi itself krishna does not cause fear in anyone in vrindavan it's not that the rajuvasi tremble in fear of krishna rather krishna fears the when yashoda mai is angry with him and she is caught him and she is about to punish him at that time krishna is trembling as we know in the damodar ashtakam is beautifully depicted that he is he is crying but and kunti maharani also prays pakram ninniya bhaya bhavanaya sthitasya samam vimohyati bhirati yat bhiteti so vaktram ninniya is looking down in fear bhaya bhava naya sthitasya and she is marveling what kind of conception of god is this samam vimohyati bhir api yat bheti that even the most powerful people are afraid of god because he is all powerful but here krishna is afraid of of a relatively a powerless person a motherly woman as a necessarily in hope fear in people yes for a child is different so krishna is like the role of a child over here similarly if we consider krishna in vrindavan krishna is not a crutch for anyone in vrindavan in fact a crutch is something which we lean on for walking 
Now, Yashoda doesn't depend on Krishna. Krishna depends on Yashoda. How is that? That actually it is Krishna who, who, when he feels hungry, he goes to Mother Yashoda and he pulls at her sari and he starts throwing a tantrum. I need food. And Mother Yashoda also means if I don't feed Krishna, he will go hungry. He will starve. He may even die. So Vrindavan depicts a very, you could say, a subversive or a revolutionary conception of God. Subversive means that which is the normal order that is subverted, that is, that is turned upside down. So one of the best ways we can understand this is <coughs> that in Vrindavan, now normally people pray to God, but the Vrajivasis pray for God. What do we mean pray for God? We see that Yashoda Mai, whenever Krishna is in danger, at that time, say for example, after he is saved from, Yash from Putana or he is saved from Trunavarta, at that time, what happens? You know, Yashoda starts ch chanting various prayers, she starts invoking various. Uh, Devata, uh, various names of Vishnu, starts making some marks or Krishna. So she is praying for Krishna. So what is going on here? You know, how can we uh, have this situation where instead of praying to God, people are praying for God. So this is where we need to understand that what is going on in Vrindavan is radically different. The Bhagavad Gita also talks about the conventional conception of God. What is going on here? That how is it that the Vrajivasis pray for Krishna? As I said, instead of praying to Krishna. <coughs> so we could say that even the Bhagavad Gita does talk about <coughs> the normal conception of God, where it says that there are four kinds of people who approach Krishna, worship him. So if you consider the distressed, the needed, those who need wealth and all that, we could say that they can broadly be classified somewhat similar to the idea of judge or crutch. But then, Krishna, that is 7.16 in the Gita, from there, Krishna goes further and he says in 719 that those who evolve much more, what happens? Bahunam janmana amante, janavan maam prapadyate, vasudevah sarvamiti, sahatma sudurlavah. That when they become janavan, they surrender completely to me. And they understand vasudevah sarvamiti. That Krishna is everything. And what is the difference? See, there is the idea of God as the fulfiller of desires. And there is the idea of God as the fulfillment of desires. Fulfiller means that he is the one who will give us some things. But fulfillment means he is everything. He is the one who we seek in our lives as our most cherished goal. So for Brajwasis, Krishna is not the fulfiller of their desires. He is the fulfillment of their desires. He is all that they want because they understand if I have Krishna, I don't need anything else. He is so lovable. And he is, therefore, all that they desire. And it's very curious in the Bhagavata 10th Canto, as well as the Goswami literature, if we see that at one level, for the Vrajivasis, does Krishna remove their distress, remove their stress or distress? Yes, he does that. But that's not what the Vrajivasis primarily relate with him for. So, for example, going back to the reasoning of, say, God as a crutch. So, oh, you have trouble and you go to God and God will help you. Now, sometimes Krishna does that for the Vrajivasis also. But actually, Krishna sometimes does the exact opposite. 
for the gopis especially and the gopis of vrindavan they gave their life to krishna and krishna left them and went away away from vrindavan and here krishna instead of being the reliever of distress was in one sense the giver of distress so if somebody is going to god simply to be to be relieved from distress they may think what is the point of going to krishna for you know here if i look at krishna's devotees i find that they are in so much trouble and it's one thing to be in trouble it's quite another thing to have god be the cause of our trouble so trouble can come in its own way sometimes some things can go wrong in our lives but here for the rajivasis krishna is the person who has gone away and in sense krishna is directly the cause of their trouble so why would anyone worship such a god so if people if 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 the krishna devotees had the vision of god as a crutch as one who can support us in our times of distress now krishna does do that we know that say for example in the govardhan leela when the rajwasis are in are attacked by indra krishna does protect them. but if if we again see the essence of the govardhan leela is not so much that krishna lifted govardhan and protected the devotees but rather under govardhan the devotees had the sweetest most intimate loving exchanges with krishna all the devotees could be constantly there beholding him for seven days and seven nights drinking in his beauty and relishing it to the supermost degree so much so that the devotees completely forgot about the fact that there was a storm out there there was torrential rains out there the devotees simply absorbed in krishna so yes there was a, there krishna does relieve devotees of distress it's not that he doesn't but devotees don't relate with krishna on that platform krishna you remove distress for me that's not the platform at which devotees relate and this is where the krishna conception you know why would anyone worship a god who seems to bring trouble into those who in the lives of those who worship him that conception makes sense only when seen through the eyes of love प्रेमांजन छुरीत भक्ति विलोचन सदैव विलोकयंती so the nature of love is that love accepts stress and distress for one's beloved this like say when a couple has a child now as soon as you have a child actually there is so much anxiety and sometimes the child is sick there is there is fear there is pain there is distress but there is love over there so there is when we talk earlier about the conception of god as a crutch or god as a judge you know that is a peace centered conception of god whereas krishna is a love centered conception peace centered conception means i want to live peacefully and yes yeah, thinking about god and praying to god will make my life peaceful well it's fine to be peaceful it's not that krishna is against peacefulness but more important than being peaceful is being purposeful is being purposeful what brings peace can be relaxing it can be calming but peace itself is not enlivening it is not thrilling it is not completely filling us with raptures of joy that is when we have a purpose the highest purpose is the purpose of love so the brajwasis they the gopis for example the gopis they love krishna and thus for krishna's sake they are ready to do everything everything means that even if krishna abandons them and goes away they continue to live on because they want krishna to be happy when he sees them when he comes back 
Krishna, we are here to serve you. Whatever happens, whatever opportunity you give us for serving you, for serving you, we are here to serve you. So, it is only if we understand God as the fulfillment of all desires, as the object of ultimate love, that the Krishna conception makes sense. So, and love often means that we use every resource that we have at our disposal for doing what we can for the beloved. And this is seen very beautifully in the Vrindavan conception that, see the, uh, <coughs> let's look at this in one way. See, the another point is that if earlier we talked about how there is a law and order because of the conception of God as a judge that is maintained in society. Well, that's good, but we will see quite often the Vrindavan Leela describes laws being broken, morality being established as well as extended or transcended. How is it transcended? It's transcended, for example, when the gopis leave their family members at home to go out alone at night. Supati Sutandva Taya Bhatra Bandhavan Ati Vilam Yate Antya Chutagataha Ati Vidastava Udgita Mohitaha Kitava Yoshitas Kastya Jainishi. The Gopis are describing how by being attracted to Krishna's flute, they are ready to give up everything and go away. Go, go to the forest. So the gopis, in one sense, transcend the principles of morality. And similarly, when Krishna is born, Vasudeva has given his word of honor that my sons I will give to you to come, sir. But then when Krishna appears, Vasudeva takes Krishna to Vrindavan at the bidding of Krishna. So Vasudeva is known to be truthful. It's not that indiscriminately he is violating truthfulness. But, but love, love is required for morality, but love is not always stuck with morality. Love knows when to go beyond morality. So if the conception of God is simply thought of as created for establishing morality, then there are times when the very depiction of God is such that morality is transcended. So what do I mean by love establishes morality and extends beyond morality? Say, for example, parents will teach their children to be truthful. And naturally, children, children learn values more by catching than by teaching. Catching means values are more taught than taught. It means if the children see that my parents are truthful, then that inspires them much more than just being given discourses that be truthful. But suppose, say, there are four or five children playing in a house, maybe the <clears throat> and then suddenly there's a fire in the house. Now there's only one adult over there. The one adult cannot pick up all the five children and go out. And they tell the children, oh, there's a fire over here, let's go. Come on, we have to go. And the children are so caught in their playing, they say, no, oh, there's no fire, we're going to play here. No, there is a fire, we have to go. But the children are not ready to listen. And the adult may say that, no, 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 we need to go out. There is a, there is a beautiful new version of this game which you are playing. That's there in that car. You go there, you can get it. Oh, really? Kids get up and run to the car. And then they find there's no game over there. What happened? And then the adult rushes into the car, locks the car and goes away from there to safety. So here, love for truthfulness is important. But there are times when for one's object of love, the truth can be transcended also. Morality can be transcended. So now, for as I mentioned earlier, that when we, there is love, Everything is invoked, every resource is used for the service of one's uh, beloved. So for the Prajivasis, when I say they pray for God. Now if they are praying for God, whom are you praying, whom are they praying to? So this is where there is a very beautiful, we could say there is a difference at one level, Krishna and Vishnu are the same person. At another level, Vishnu is, can be conceived as God in an office and Krishna is God at home. So the Vrajivasis 
are at one level they love Krishna in the sense that they are uh, Krishna Bhaktas. But however, they don't conceive of Krishna as God. They conceive of Krishna as just their lovable coward hero. And for his protection, they may pray even to Vishnu. So, if you see in the Vrajalila, it is described how Krishna, Yashoda Mai marks Krishna's body with tilaks. She chants various mantras. And these mantras are all centered on Vishnu. Uh, they are invoking Vishnu. So, it's almost like we could say, to uh, nuance that earlier statement further, that the Vrajivasis pray for God to God. But these are two different manifestations. They pray for Krishna to Vishnu. Although at one level Krishna and Vishnu are the same, still for them the center is Krishna. And everything that we can do for Krishna, we will do. So we will even worship Vishnu and pray to Vishnu so that Krishna will be taken care of. And that is the extraordinary nature of Krishna's love. Now, moving forward, if we consider that when Krishna descends to this world, there are, there are multiple verses which talk about this. So we could say Krishna's mission can be like a, can be conceived of like a pyramid. So when we talk about Krishna's descent, there is a famous verse, 4, 7 and 8 in the Bhagavad Gita, which people often talk about, when many Hindus almost know by heart, yada yada hi dharmasya, glanir bhavati bharata, abhyutthanam dharmasya, tadatmanam srujamyaham, paritranaya sadhunam, vinashaya cha dushkritam, dharma samsthapanarthaya, sambhavami yuge yuge, so sambhavami yuge yuge. Krishna says, I descend again and again for what? Dharma samsthapanarthaya. So this can be said to be at the level of the establisher of law. So Krishna establishes dharma and he empowers his devotees to establish dharma. So paritranaya sadhuna vinashaya dushkritam. That means paritranaya, he empowers the virtuous and vinashaya dushkritam. He disempowers the vicious. And that's how he establishes order, establishes law in the world. And um, many, if you read any standard Hindu texts or uh, search for popular verses from the Gita, this 4, 7 and 4, 8 come out quite often. If you look at Shri Prabhupada's uh, uh, talks on the Gita, or if you look at which verses Prabhupada quotes most, more than 4, 7 and 4, 8, Prabhupada quotes the next verse, that is 4, 9. And 4, 9 talks about this level. Janma karma chame divyam evam yoveti tatvataha kyaktva deham punar janma naiti mameti so arjuna naiti mameti Krishna says that those who understand me in truth they will become so attracted to me that they will come to me and they won't return to this world again. So this is a vision of Krishna as the invoker of love. That Krishna descends to the world to invoke love in our hearts, to inspire us to become more loving, not loving in a sentimental or sensual sense. Sensual means at the physical level, sentimental means merely at the emotional level, but loving in a holistic sense, where body, mind, soul, everything is holistically channeled. So Krishna invokes that kind of love. So what does Krishna do? He, when we understand that such a loving Lord who, who <coughs> delights in the reciprocation of love so much that in Vrindavan, he doesn't act as the establisher of law. So this establisher of law is the conventional conception of God which is there, no doubt. I talked earlier of a crutch or a judge. Hmm? But Krishna and Vrindavan goes far beyond that to being the invoker of love. And that is Prabhupada's mood. And that's why Prabhupada quotes 4-9 much more. That understand Krishna's pastimes, 
not just so that oh, Krishna came and established dharma. We may wonder what about it now. Well, Krishna, even if that dharma is not there in today's society, but by understanding Krishna's uh, pastimes, prema, divine love can be invoked in the hearts of each one of us at every moment. And uh, Krishna in Vrindavan does not act as God. In fact, Krishna loves, loves so much that he subordinates himself to love. That means Krishna subordinates his divinity so that love can reign supreme in Vrinda. And that, that is this, that is the vision of God who is present in our hearts. That is the vision of the God who descends in Janmashtami. So Janmashtami, he doesn't just come to establish order in this world. Rather, he wants to elevate us, our consciousness above this world, and ultimately to him. So now in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna doesn't just establish dharma himself. He doesn't say that, okay, I come to establish dharma, but he wants Arjuna to become his instrument in establishing dharma. Asmatam tishayasho labhasva kitva shatran bhumshvarajan samriddham mayai vaite nihatahapur vameva nimittamatram bhavasau vyasachi. So Krishna tells Arjuna, you become an instrument, you attain victory. By my mercy, by my empowerment, your enemies will be defeated. So Krishna in urges us to assist him in his mission. So what is Krishna's mission. At one level, if we see Krishna saying, Arjuna, fight a war. So that means Krishna is inspiring Arjuna to assist him in establishing Dharma. And that is the mood of the Mahabharata. And that's important. But we see in the Bhagavatam, the vision of Arjuna and his relationship with Krishna is very different. See, the Mahabharata, to a large extent, depicts God at the conventional level. Yes, devotees face distress, but then ultimately they are victorious. And Krishna is there to assist them in gaining victory. However, the Bhagavatam goes further. The Bhagavatam's vision of Arjuna is very distinctive. In fact, the it's amazing in the Bhagavatam, uh, what is told and what is not told. Say, for example, um, <clears throat> say if you are in a particular city, say now in America, in certain cities, there is a lot of racial unrest, even riots are going on. So if a particular news channel, it, it tells about some small events that happened here, small events that happened there, but it doesn't tell about big events that happened, some, that happened somewhere else. You wonder what's going on. Now, maybe there was one, one person shot over here, and that's reported. But there were 15 people shot over there, 25 people shot over there, that is not reported. You think, okay, does this newspaper have some agenda? Does this newspaper have some agenda that it wants to describe only this kind of violence because that fits in its narrative, and this doesn't fit in its narrative, that's why it's not describing it. So, what someone is not telling is telling. Telling means it is revealing. So what a newspaper doesn't tell is it reveals its agenda, its bias, its purpose. So similarly, in the Bhagavatam, there are 90 chapters in the 10th canto describing Krishna's pastimes. And the Bhagavatam doesn't, what to speak of spare one chapter, it doesn't spare even a few verses in the 10th canto to describe Krishna's pastimes in Kurukshetra. In fact, what does the Bhagavatam do at that time? At that time, when the Kurukshetra war is going on, the Bhagavatam curiously just describes Balgram's, Balgram's pilgrimage. And how Balgram goes here and Ilaval and other demons that he, he kills. And then he comes back when the whole Kurukshetra war is over. And then there is Bhima and Arjuna, Bhima and Rulan's fight going on. So now why? You know, if Krishna Lila is going on and Krishna plays such a dramatic, thrilling role in the, in the Mahabharata. 
uh, how he helps Arjuna in so many, so many amazing ways. It's very, very relishable. Yet the Bhagavatam sidesteps that. Now, there are multiple reasons for this. One is that you know, that war was very traumatic for Abhi, for, uh, for Parikshit. Because in that war, Parikshit Maharaj's father, Abhimanyu, was killed. And in the, now that it's the 10th canto, that means almost 5th or 6th day of the 7-day seven, seven recitation. Therefore, it is that Parikshit Maharaj, Shukdev Goswami doesn't want Parikshit Maharaj to get distracted in any way from fire, from focusing on Krishna. So that's one reason why avoids that description. But there's another reason. That is, that his focus is something substantially different. His focus is on depicting, not just depicting how Krishna will make you victorious in this world. You know, in the, in the, if you see at one level, the success of the Bhagavatam is not, what is the success of the Bhagavatam? It starts by describing how Parikshit Maharaj was cursed to die in seven days. And it concludes by describing how Parikshit Maharaj died after seven days. So, and it seems to be unfair. Why did he have to die? It really done something minor wrong. But the Bhagavatam describes how by hearing about Krishna, love for Krishna was invoked in Parikshit Maharaj's heart and that became complete completely permeated his heart and his entire being. And that is the purpose of the Bhagavatam. So just as Krishna's descent has an external purpose, establishing dharma. But the internal purpose is invoking love. And I've depicted this as a pyramid because most people can relate only with God as the establisher of dharma. And that's good. And it, it should be also that not all people are there at the level where they can appreciate the idea of loving God, and giving one's life for loving God. So for them, to understand God as the establisher of law is good. And that's why Krishna says, Manushanam Sahasreshu. So as you go upward pyramid, the number of people at the top of the pyramid are few. The number of people at the bottom of the pyramid will be large. So the, the, the widespread conception of God will be as the establisher of law. But the esoteric, the special conception of God will be as the invoker of law. And... The, uh, similarly, so Arj neither Arjuna's heroics nor Krishna's heroics in the Kurukshetra war are described in the Bhagavatam much in the 10th canto. Now, in the first canto, they are described in the 15th chapter. And there it is described in the form of Arjuna looking back at the memories of the Mahabharata war. So we could say, that the Bhagavatam is spoken in the shadow of Krishna. The Bhagavatam is spoken in the shadow of the momentous occurrence of Krishna's appearance and then disappearance. <clears throat> so just like say India again, Independence in 47. So for maybe one or two generations after that, the event of the independence of India was so momentous that that is constantly there in the collective memory of the country. But now as 60, 70 years passed on, now that Independence Day, still we celebrate, we celebrate it, but that might not, not evoke that much emotions. So the Bhagavatam is very close to Krishna's disappearance. So then what remains after Krishna's disappearance? Is, what remains after Krishna's disappearance is Krishna's remembrance. And thus, the, the Arjuna that is depicted in the Bhagavatam is not the Arjuna who is victorious over everyone in the Kurukshetra war. This is the Arjuna who seems to lose everything. He loses a battle to some infidel coward men, coward people. And so he is, so everything that is worth living for Arjuna that is lost. See, for us, basically we live for two things. We have certain possessions and we have certain relations. There are people in our lives and the things in our life. And those two are what give value to our life. Now Arjuna, Krishna has disappeared for him. And then the most important relation, what am I living for? And then at least yeah, his position, it was not just wealth for him, his greatest position was his ability, his archery skill. And that deserted him. So he has neither position 
no relation. So what am I going to live for? And that is the time when he remembers Krishna. And that remembrance of Krishna, it is described in the Bhagavatam, fills him with so much love for Krishna. That by that love, he transcends the world. He transcends the duality of the world. So the Bhagavatam does not depict Krishna primarily as the blesser and the provider of worldly goods. Yes, God can do that. <coughs> and he does do it at times. But the Bhagavatam depicts Krishna as the provider of immense spiritual enrichment. Such spiritual enrichment that any kind of material enrichment pales in comparison as compared to that. So for the Vrajvasis also, Krishna's disappearance in the sense that Krishna has left Vrindavan. But what happens? By Krishna's disappearance comes greater Krishna's remembrance. And that is the mystery of Krishna consciousness. That <coughs> sometimes the absence of Krishna invokes a deeper presence of Krishna. So now, as I said, this was the point I was making throughout. Krishna in Vrindavan is centered more on invoking love and reciprocating love. And the Bhagavatam depicts Krishna, Krishna, say for example, when Krishna associates Arjuna, he doesn't depict so much the Kurukshetra heroics as the mood of Vrindavan, of remembrance in separation, of remembrance in absence. And now, as I said, Krishna's mission is twofold. As I said, establisher of law and the invoker of love. And for all of us, in our particular roles in society, we all can play roles. So now, can we establish dharma in society? Yes, we can to some extent. But we may, not, may or may not have the social influence to establish the rule of law. If, some of us, if somebody is in a position of a kshatriya, whether they are in, in the government is ruling or they are in an administrative position somewhere, but they can do some things like Arjuna did. But even if we can or can't assist in Krishna's mission of establishing the rule of law, we all can have the influence in our small circles to bring more love into everything that we do. Bring more love means, love in the sense of Vrindavan means sacrifice. Love means service. Love doesn't mean... Uh, sentimental kind of hormonal attraction, doesn't mean a feel-good kind of uh, sentimentality. It means service and sacrifice. And this is what Srila Prabhupada demonstrates. After Krishna's appearance, the next day is Prabhupada's appearance. And that is very symbolic that Krishna came to this world, but how to reach Krishna? Even when he has reached into this world, that is revealed by his devotees. So Krishna's appearance is followed by the appearance of his devotee. And Prabhupada's love for Krishna is demonstrated not by so much his crying tears of ecstasy, not by his rolling on the ground, but Prabhupada's love for Krishna is demonstrated through his service and sacrifice. So he brought love into everything that he did, in the way he interacted with people. When Prabhupada interacted with his with, with devotees, you know, every devotee with whom he interacted, he felt as if you know, Prabhupada cared for them. That not only, it was Krishna's love coming through Prabhupada to them. Now we all may feel that there are so many things which need, which need to change in the world. Now because of the pandemic, there is so much anxiety, there is so much fear, there is so much uncertainty. And apart from that, there are a hundred things wrong in the world. So, even when Shila Prabhupada was here on the planet, there were so many things wrong at that time. So, Krishna's descent into the world is not just a historical event that happened long ago. It is meant to invoke love within us. Love within us means what? That now the paradox of the world is everyone wants, wants change, but no one wants to change. Everyone wants change. Oh, things should change. Things should become better. But no one wants to change. However, it doesn't need... Uh, can we, we may say, what can what difference can I make? No, each of us, we can decide. In, okay, let me become a little more devotional in everything that I do. Devotional means, let me, whatever situation I am in, there might be a pandemic in the world, there might be some anxiety, whatever it is, 
relation crisis, financial crisis. Can I bring a little more service attitude into what I do? Can I do a little more sacrifice? And we will find that service and sacrifice, if done in a mood of devotion, they won't cause impoverishment. They will actually bring enrichment. See, normally when we do service, we think I'm doing something for someone. When I'm doing sacrifice, I think I'm doing something for someone, therefore I'm losing something. But in bhakti, when we do service and sacrifice, when we offer a part of our consciousness to Krishna, Krishna comes into our consciousness. And therefore, service and sacrifice done in the mood of devotion doesn't cause impoverishment. It brings enrichment. And each of us, in whatever situation we are in, if we take this responsibility to have service and sacrifice, then we all can contribute in fulfilling Krishna's mission of invoking love. And I'll conclude with this theme that what is surrender? Surrender is not just acceptance of situations, but surrender is also acceptance of responsibility. Yes, this is the situation I am in. I accept that situation. That is my surrender. But even in this situation, I am going to serve Krishna. That is responsibility. Prabhupada had nothing, but still he had the determination to serve Krishna. He somehow published some books and then carried those books with him to America. You know, Vasudev had nothing, but when Krishna was born, at least in the mind he desired, I want to give charity. He, when Vasudev was told, go to Krishna, go take Krishna to Vrindavan, he didn't know how he was going to do it. But he was able to do it by Krishna's mercy. So surrender means acceptance of responsibility. And what does acceptance of responsibility mean? That we could say surrender can be defined in this sense as do what we can with what we have now. Do what we can. Yes, whatever. We may think, oh, if only I had more time, more talent, more ability, better, better association of devotees, better family relationships, more supportive family members, greater financial stability, better health. Yes, all these can help us. But we don't have to wait for these to come. Do what we can with what we have now. And if we do this, we will find, we may not make a big difference in the world, but we can make a significant difference in our world. Just by taking up a responsibility for service and sacrifice for Krishna, we will find that Krishna will manifest more in our hearts and we will become more enriched thereby. And that is the Janmashtami uh, that can occur constantly in our heart. Janmashtami is about the manifestation of Krishna, not just as he had happened thousands of years ago, but as he may manifest in our hearts. And Krishna can manifest in our hearts if we turn to him with devotion and we offer ourselves in service and sacrifice. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. So I spoke on how to appreciate the Krishna conception of God, that quite often, People think of, in today's world, people think of God as a judge or as a crutch. God is somebody whose fear keeps us, uh, keeps people law-abiding or whose existence makes people believe that they will get justice in future if they are subject to injustice right now. Or crutch means that when they are facing too many difficulties, some people need some emotional support. And that is belief in God provides them that. Now, that is true, Some many people approach God that way. But Krishna in Vrindavan is neither a judge nor a crutch. Now, far from people being afraid of him, Rajwasis being afraid of him, Krishna is afraid of the Rajwasis, like Yashoda Mai. Far from he providing a crutch, he being a crutch to Yashoda Mai, he depending, Yashoda Mai depending on him, Yashoda depends on, he depends on Yashoda for food. So, uh, so much so that, the Rajwasis don't even pray to Krishna. They pray for Krishna. So, and for, for Krishna's sake, they are ready to take trouble. So they see Krishna not as the fulfiller of their desires, but as the fulfillment of their desires. The Krishna conception of God, where devotees are ready to take up anxiety for Krishna's sake, as Yashoda Mai takes when she has to care for Krishna, where devotees are even ready to transcend morality for Krishna's sake. 
where Vasudev speaks counterfactually for Krishna's sake, where devotees are ready to take agony and heartbreak for Krishna's sake, as the gopis accept when they develop a relationship with Krishna and when Krishna leaves in Bozavi. All this dynamic, this vision of God can make sense only when it is love-centered, not peace-centered. That Krishna in Vrindavan is not interested in establishing order and maintaining order. Krishna is interested in exchanging love. And sometimes love is best exchanged when order is disrupted. Because then the moment the, the connections become deepened in that anxiety. As it happens when and Govardhan Nila, when all the when the the normal order of all the Rajivasis staying in home is disrupted. But then all the devotees come together under Govardhan. So <clears throat> we concluded by talking about how Krishna's descent serves multiple purposes like a pyramid, the establisher of law and the invoker of love. So for people in general, Krishna helps in establishing law. For the devotees, he's invoking love. And the Mahabharata has a vision of God as the establisher of law. The Bhagavatam doesn't even mention about the Mahabharata in the 10th canto. What the Bhagavatam is not telling is telling. It is revealing. It doesn't want to have Parikmara agitated. And it also doesn't want to focus on this vision of God who will be provider of peace on, in this world. So uh, the Bhagavatam's vision of Arjuna is is Arjuna who is materially battered and shattered. Both his most important relation, Krishna, and his most important possession, Archarya, Archarya ability, both are lost. And that's when, in the absence of Krishna, is felt the deepest presence of Krishna. So for all of us, Janmashtami may seem like a historical event that happened thousands of years ago. What difference does it make to us? But the essence of Janmashtami is the manifestation of Krishna, not just in the world, but in our hearts. And how can Krishna manifest? When we focus not on the peace-centered approach to God, but the love-centered approach. Love is expressed through service and sacrifice. And service and sacrifice won't cause impoverishment. We won't lose, but it will bring up more enrichment. And we discussed that surrender is not just acceptance of situations. Yes, it is true but it's also acceptance of responsibility to do our part in the situations. And what is our part? Do what we can with what we have now. That's what Srila Prabhupada did. And Krishna used Prabhupada for extraordinary change in the world. Now, so everyone wants, wants change, but no one wants to change. If we take the inspiration from Janmashtami and try to bring small changes, bring a little more love, bring a little more service and sacrifice in whatever rules that we are doing. We may not make a difference in the world, but we can make a significant difference in our world. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Sri Krishna Bhagavan Ki Jai. Janmashtami Mahamatsav Ki Jai. Thank you. Prabhuji, thank you so much for the very, very beautiful class. You know, it's very nice to start uh, Janmashtami Day with this meditation of the Lord. So, uh, one question is, um, the other day there was a seven-year, eight-year-old boy who was asking about uh, this, that, uh, uh, you know, when when I steal, uh, do something, it is wrong. But why when Krishna steals, it is uh, glorified? So I, my question is twofold. Uh, the contradictory actions of the Lord, how to explain this to, uh, how to understand this ourselves and also explain to uh, kids of seven, eight years old. Okay. How to explain something like Krishna stealing to small children, say of a few years old, of this, yeah. Yeah, I think it is uh, uh, not very easy to echo to all the philosophy, but any kind of education begins with explaining black and white. 
And then there is the explanation of shades of grey. That means uh, first we tell this is right, this is wrong. But then there are some times when something which is not uh, right, which is normally not right, may be right. Like I gave the example of the, a child who is caught in fire, which was caught in plague amid a house in a house in fire. So the child may not realize, but afterward, oh, this whole house got burned. I might have been got burned also. But then they understand what the parents did was right. So I I don't know exactly how we could convey it, but broadly speaking, there is there are three things. Whenever we decide right or wrong, there is the content of what we are doing. Then before the content comes the intent of why we are doing it, and there is the consequence of why we do it. A consequence of what happens after we do it. So, so a black and white conception of things is based only on looking at the content. This is right and this is wrong. But a more nuanced understanding looks at not just the content but also why something is done and what is the result of doing it. And <clears throat> this is something which uh, is not extremely difficult to understand. That sometimes, which is something which is uh, hey, for children also, we can say that suppose you have a you have a friend who is being bullied by someone, and that friend maybe comes to you and asks, "Where can I know this person bullying me? Where can I hide?" And then you tell him, "Maybe go over there and hide in that uh, that closet." And the bully comes and asks you, "Well, do you have you seen this person? Or should you speak the truth?" Well, normally we speak the truth, but in this case, speaking the truth will cause injury to your friend. So then, maybe at that time, we need to adjust. So, so that's why you know we can give examples which can make sense to the children. So, in the in the case of Krishna, and Krishna is stealing, it is stealing. It is simply to increase the reciprocation of love. So, at one level, if we consider Krishna as God, everything belongs to Him. He doesn't need to steal anything. And Krishna steals butter simply because He can increase the excitement in the pastimes of His devotees, and that invokes love more and more. So, the the reason why somebody does it that is also important. Normally, in this world, when we talk about robbery, the robbery causes harm to people. Robbery causes, say, for example, now some some peaceful protesters come, and then instead of the among the peaceful protesters, there are some criminals who come in, and they cause rioting, and they they destroy sometimes millions of dollars of worth of property. That's that's seriously damaging. So that's bad. The stealing often leads to harm for others, but in the case of Krishna, his stealing is not causing to harm any to anyone. It is simply increasing the reciprocation of love. So, both from why it is done and what is the result of it being done. It is not that Krishna is in the inner mind of stealing; he is leaving all the Rajavasis bankrupt by taking away all their possessions. Obviously not. And his intent is is to increase the reciprocation of love. So, you can think of what examples would work for a seven, eight year old child. But this is a broad principle. Uh, we need to sooner or later. Explain that apart from black and white understanding of things, there are other factors also to be considered. Does that help? Very much, Prabhuji. Thank you so much, Prabhuji. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Dandavat Pranams. This is Amitabha Pranta. So, Prabhu, I have this question which uh, many people ask. Like, um, we follow uh, fasting uh, on Janmashtami for the whole day, and whereas it is a very happy day for us, so people ask, why don't we feast as opposed to fasting on a day when it is such a happy occasion? So, what is the spiritual reasoning behind? And of course, we are focusing more our mind and body on uh, the Supreme. But how do we explain to people who are celebrating with feasting rather than fasting yeah it's, a, it's not uh, very easy to explain that 
that we basically if we consider there are two different things going on <clears throat> why do we fast on the occasion of celebration well because there is what are we celebrating it is celebration is not we have achieved something special it is just yes, something special has been benedicted in our life that is krishna has appeared so the whole mood is that as i said love it's a loving occasion of love but in the bhakti tradition love is expressed more through service and sacrifice not so more through say consumption and self, con that kind of things so the idea is that a devotee wants to offer one's consciousness more and more to krishna on the occasion of his appearance and in that sense a devotee wants to avoid letting the consciousness be consumed by anything else and say cooking food serving food all this takes and it takes time it takes energy it takes consciousness so our primary purpose is that for a devotee fasting is not so much an austerity centered on deprivation deprivation of the body depriving the body but for a devotee fasting is a means for preventing the 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 dissipation of consciousness to anywhere other than krishna i have a class on my website as you call it the the resistance and the romance of fasting so now the word romance normally associated with sensual love but actually in the path of bhakti uh, fasting is is an expression of our heart's love and of course when as a uh, when we offer our love to krishna uh, krishna manifests his presence in our hearts so it is in anticipation of krishna's appearance that we don't want to be distracted by anything else we're so eager that krishna come that we are eagerly waiting a whole day till midnight and midnight is the time when krishna appears and then there is of course we take food so yes it is celebration but it is a celebration of the loving appearance of the lord and fasting is an expression of our undistracted anticipation for the lord's appearance and after the appearance is there then there is celebration in a different way celebration in the way by which we take food also so of course fasting is not uh, is not it is not meant to make us unbearably uncomfortable fasting is definitely going to be uncomfortable no doubt but if it is unbearably uncomfortable there the in the not not having food is causing so much anxiety and uh, so much inconvenience or pain that one can't think of krishna at all one is thinking only of food 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 then we yes, take some food so uh, the point is that not that we don't take food the point is that we want to offer as much of our consciousness as possible to krishna on this day and there are some traditional ways in which that aspiration to offer our consciousness to krishna is is we could say ritualized or standardized and one such way is by abstaining from the distraction of food but if it if it is very difficult then take whatever food is necessary and then the refocus on krishna does it answer your question yes prabhu thank you so much hari krishna hari okay, krishna then last question Hare Krishna Prabhu ji and all pranam august shila prabhu thank you so much prabhu ji for coming on the call and giving your valuable time and association prabhu ji uh, i have a question like uh, we, uh, we uh, because of janmashtami we are hearing so many classes and uh, krishna killing so many demons every day and each demon represents a the each like anarthas different different faults he goes and mm -hmm. like that so how to invite krishna to kill those demons inside us i 
Okay. Because we don't even know that those are there. We say, oh no, I am right. We always say I am right. Okay, so now uh, let's look at this in a little analytical way and but in a practical way. So the various various demons in our heart, and how can we invite Krishna to destroy the remove those demons from our heart? Well, <clears throat> first as I said, let's look at it from analytical way. This correlation of Krishna. Uh, Krishna's pastimes and especially Krishna's demon killing pastimes with uh, with uh, the presence of certain anarthas in our heart and the removal, the removal of those anarthas. This is done by Bhaktivinoda Thakur in our tradition in his primarily in his book Krishna Samhita. Now the Goswamis have written elaborately about Krishna Leela. And they haven't talked about this kind of metaphorical uh, reading or metaphorical correlation of the various demons. Even Srila Prabhupada did not talk about this too much. He, he does talk about metaphorical some things in terms of, say, the six uh, children of Devaki who were killed by Kamsa represent the six Anarthas. But the specific Anarthas which which Bhaktivinoda Thakur talks about, that is a contribution distinctive, almost unique to Bhaktivinoda Thakur. And if you look at the overall context of his book, uh, see, basically, at that time, there was this whole idea that rituals and rituals are, are for less intelligent, superstitious kind of people. And so India was in a Bhaktivinoda Thakur lived at a time which was called the Indian Renaissance. So India was in a state of cultural and intellectual ferment. And at that time, what happened is that people, many people from the Western thinkers, even among the Britishers, some were, some were evangelical Christians who wanted to Christianize India, and some were rationalists who wanted to modernize India by rejecting religion entirely and make them into atheists, materialists. But both of them by criticizing Indian religions. This is such a primitive system. And now there were many Indian thinkers at that time. Some of them just rejected, uh, rejected Indian thought and became either rationalists or Christians. But there were some others who were trying to see what is good in our tradition and take that. So, Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, some of you have studied Indian independence, he was, a, uh, he was quite an influential person. Uh, and there were others also, I think he wrote the Vande Matram. So, he was a contemporary of Bhaktivinoda Thakur. So, he had written the book about Krishna. And Krishna at that time was criticized quite severely uh, for the immorality of his activities, for the Rasthila with the gopis and for some of the questionable ways in which Krishna arranged for the Kauravas to be killed. So then what Pankim Rai did was that he's, uh, and people like him did that, mm. they tried to sanitize Krishna. Sanitize Krishna means, they said that actually the real Krishna is the, the you could say the Yugandhara, the Dharma, the person who comes to establish Dharma. And all these sentiment, all these stories about Krishna as a child, you know, lifting up a hill or putting a hand into a mouth of a demon and killing a horse and killing that horse or stealing butter or dancing with the gopis of Vrindavan. He says all this is a later addition and it's just sentimental. And they tried to sanitize and rejected almost all of Krishna and Vrindavan. So, now, Bhaktivana Thakur would talk with him, Bhaktivana, and he explained how this, the, the whole purpose of Krishna Dila uh, is to experience rasa. And rasa is experienced primarily in Vrindavan. And that is through the pastime of the devotees, pastime of Krishna with the devotees. And now, this was not a very easy concept to understand. So, what Bhaktivana Thakur did was he wrote his own book, Krishna Samhita, and there he talks about that. There are people who say, okay, there are these stories, 
and the stories may be sentimental but there are some moral lessons from these stories and let us learn those moral lessons so even now there are many people who will say if you have a book on life lessons from mahabharat life lessons from ramayan people are interested in that they are not interested in the in relishing the ramayan and mahabharat per se they are interested in the life lessons from it. which is not bad but again it is like what what can this ramayan offer me ram is not the goal of my life but ram is a tool by which i can learn something at least that level they are approaching the ramayan that is good so that was there is a more a utilitarian approach to scripture rather than a devotional approach so what bhakti na thakur did was he took those terms uh, where there is uh, like we have the terms kanishtha adhikari madhyam adhikari uttam adhikari or kanishtha madhyam uttama three levels preliminary intermediate and advanced and he re- redefined those terms in a way different from what rupa goswami has done and he said now i am just using these words for simplicity three words he translated kanishtha as literalists that he said the kanishtha are people who take everything literally they believe that for example there was a that there was a giant snake and krishna danced on that snake and they are at a particular level kanishtha and then there is the madhyama who are higher than the kanishtha they go beyond the literal to the metaphorical Hmm. and then he said okay and obviously those who go beyond a little to the metaphorical they are more intelligent and in this way basically those who were who who thought of the the stories of krishna as like as myths told for kids and believed only by a pre rational people he patted them on their back yeah, yeah actually you know yes you are more intelligent than the sentimental people who believe all these stories however he said this is what this metaphorical level is the madhyama level and beyond that there is the uttama and uttama is the transcendental or the rasic level and the rasic level is where we hear those pastimes and relish those pastimes and experience sublime divine love for krishna and in this way he said yes yes you are more intelligent than these people who who are just sentimental but there is a level higher than yours also so what happens is so those people who want to talk about metaphorical interpretations he appreciates their intelligence and he also gives them some some kind of interpretation that is a metaphorical for the various demons now if you look at krishna samhita or chaitanya shikshamrut where he talks about this he doesn't elaborately go about explaining how this particular demon represents this i did a series of classes on demons in krishna lila where i tried to flesh out and explain the how which demon can represent can be said to represent what but bhakti not thakur's purpose is not specifically to to go so elaborately explain the correlation between a particular demon and a particular anartha his point is to get people to appreciate that there is more than simple that there is more to krishna leela than some some childish bedtime stories and thus he gives them a metaphorical reading but beyond that he says that it is transcendental reading so for all and what he says is that yes if we hear this if you hear a particular past time then when krishna kills that demon that particular anartha as in our heart will be killed so now that's a that's a valid way in which people who are approaching scripture in a more utilitarian way yes you know you have a sectarian mentality Oh, i want to get rid of that mentality or i have a mentality to deceive others by by pretending to know something that i don't know like a putana or the false guru and he explains that to them how to go about doing it uh, so is here those past times so for us also you know if we can if we can if we identify that i have a particular anartha and then we find out from bhakti not akur right okay this demon represents this anartha then we can recite we can maybe re- read that past time repeatedly memorize some verses contemplate those verses and that can help us combat that particular anartha but we don't have to focus too much on that hmm? so that that correlation of the anarthas with uh, of demons with anarthas is something which bhakti not thakur did for a particular purpose and we can also use it for that particular purpose but our primary purpose in practicing bhakti is not so much anarthanivritti 
as artha pravritti. Anartha nivritti is the rejection, the removal of the negative things in our heart. Artha pravritti is the invocation of the of the of the latent or the potential love for Krishna in our hearts. So just hear Krishna Leela, try to relish it as much as possible, and by that, by that. By that itself, anarthas will go away. And of course, if we find a particular anartha troubling us too much, then we can adopt some specific measures for combating that anartha. But otherwise, there is no need to obsess too much on that. We appreciate Bhaktivinoda Thakur's brilliance in giving these kind of metaphorical readings. But, and we also appreciate that Krishna Leela, the level of relishing rasa, is beyond. See, anartha nivritti is at the level of utilitarian, mm, the second level, madhyama level. At the uttama level is the rasika level. So, artha pravritti is at the rasika level. And if you can focus on artha pravritti, then that is the best. Okay. Does it answer your question? So, th thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Prabhuji. Thank you very much. Thank you. Krishna Janmash Tamiki. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prabhuji. Koti Koti Danvat Pranam. Shila Prabhas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful yeah. to be with yeah. all of you after a long time. Yeah. Hare Krishna. Take care. Yeah, Hare Krishna. <laughs> So let's pay yeah, our obeisances to all the Vaishnavas and the Prabhu. Vancha Kalpataru Vyascha, Kripasindu Vyevacha, Kalitana Pavani Vyuva. Vyevacha, 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 V